With that, uh, I will again welcome you here and introduce Nigam Shah, who's going to give us a brief primer on uh, large language models. Nigam is a professor of medicine and biomedical data science. As I said, he's the chief, chief data scientist at Stanford Healthcare and a co-director of Amy. Nigam, thank you. All right. So this is kind of scary because I'm in the computer science department talking about stuff that these folks here build. Uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to try and do is to sort of level set us for a conversation where computer scientists, medical professionals, lawyers, and patients can talk with the same common set of facts. So that's the intent. I will gloss over some technical details on purpose. Um, so let's uh, dive in. So how to think about these things? Here's a simple example of a language model. There's a sentence, where are we? And the fourth word is going. And you can imagine learning the probability of this sequence of words happening as just a multiple of probability of seeing the word where, seeing the word are given where, seeing we given these two words, and seeing going given these three. And if your training set was just two sentences, where are we going and where are we at, this probability of that pink word would be 0.5. That's the basic. That's our training data. At a general level, a language model is essentially learning these probabilities on a massive scale. Massive as in billions of parameters. And rumor has it GPT-4 is a trillion parameters. They don't exactly tell us how many, so who knows? Um, but that's what a language model is. Now, when we take this to these large language models, there's a couple of tricks. We take some data. We mask a few things out. This is the BERT pre-training objective. I know that. Uh, uh, we feed it into this thing called a transformer. came out in 2017 from Google. And we ask the computer to, quote, unquote, fill in the blank. GPT is strictly autoregressive or causal. So it is only predicting the next word or words up to 4,000, 8,000, what have you. Uh, but you can set up the pre-training in this manner where it's trying to fill in the blank looking both before and after, and that also has some value. So again, we don't have to over-index just on GPT. We're talking language models, and there's BERT, which has a whole bunch of other values. So that's, now I have trouble imagining an equation like this with billions of parameters. Like I just can't fathom it. Uh, and so it's easier to just put a little box, <laughs> call it the language model, uh, and say we are producing some text, giving some text input, and it is going to either produce a text output or this thing, which we often lose track of in the media conversation. This is the embedding or the learned representation of a word, a sentence, or a paragraph, a vector of 256, 512 numbers that tell you the essence of what the word or the paragraph or the sentence or the whole document means. Now, right now, we're all a little bit excited about the text output and the human AI interaction. But I would bet you these things are going to have equal, if not higher value. And we're not looking there. Now, training these things, the language models, is an expensive enterprise. Uh, Big bio was 2.5 million bucks. GPT-4 is greater than 100 million. That's all Sam Altman would confirm in a public setting. Uh, and then pick your favorite number in between for what it would be for GPT-3. Now, we'll, we'll come back to these two in just a second. From a computer standpoint or from a thinking standpoint, language models are an instance of a foundation model, which is a term coined here. Uh, by Percy Liang's uh, team, Rishi Bomasani is the first author on that mega paper, 258 pages or something. Um, and language in this case is any set of symbols or tokens. Could be sounds, could be pixels, could be ICD codes. So I would submit to you that the sequence of codes in the EHR comprises a language. When I use the word language, I don't mean language as in natural language. I mean language as in these codes. 
This is a longitudinal record up here. And at any given event, a bunch of tokens get generated. And these are, these are those tokens. They're sampled from a finite set. 20,000-ish tokens, give or take, that are commonly used. You could think of it as a protein sequence, if you will. But there's time. And not that many people thinking about language models are paying attention to time. It's not about what the next word is going to be. It is about how many days till the next word. It's a very different pre-training objective. Okay, so assuming that you pay attention to all of that, in healthcare, we believe there's a bunch of value that foundation models, and I intentionally am using the word foundation model, not just a language model, uh, that can have. And we laid them out in this blog post uh, on, on the high website, so I invite you to go look at it. And, and these are the, the six ones, better accuracy, less labeled data, simplified deployment, emergent applications, dealing with multimodal applications and novel human AI interfaces like ChatGPT. So I would say that there's two views on how to use such models, and by such, I mean foundation models. Uh, if we're working with language as a natural language, the prose that is in clinical documents, I would argue that these things should be called Clinical language models are CLAMs. So one of my students came up with this terminology. And again, I would point out, we're going a little bit overboard with these tasks, the generative tasks. It is possible to feed in the entire longitudinal record with the implicit time dimension in it, not before, after, but the amount of time we would refer to a foundation model of that nature as a femur, a foundation model for electronic medical records. These things allow us to then have downstream classifiers and prediction tasks that have learned the language of the EHR. <clears throat> so we still call them foundation models, oh, sorry, language models. They're trained in a very similar fashion using the transformer architecture but they have very little to do with words as in English or Spanish or Swahili. All right, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So when we're talking about the textual output, the emphasis is on documents. We input prose and we get prose back. Where when we're talking about using embeddings, the emphasis should be on timelines because everything in medicine happens over time. And I'm gonna keep using this red and blue. So let's uh, double click on the embeddings. So the intuition here is that we can do some self-supervised learning over the EHR language. We have this large unlabeled patient population in the millions, timelines. We have what happened, then what happened, then what happened, then what happened for millions of patients. And we can train a foundation model on it to predict the next code or to predict how many days till the next code or how many days to a specific next code. And this shared structure allows transfer of these things, these learned patterns to a new problem, such as now I want to build a classifier for who's going to develop lupus nephritis. I don't need as many training data. I can do it with like 60 examples, few shot, sometimes even zero shot. So there's a few efforts like this where we made the unfortunate choice of using the word language. <laughs> Uh, but it is the EHR language, not prose. Uh, and these are the value propositions. You get some increase in your classification accuracy. Classifiers decay less as time passes. Validated. They transport better across subgroups from adult to pediatrics, from here to Toronto. Again, everything I'm telling you, there's a paper uh, uh, to point to. If we start paying attention to time, like till when something happens, we get a further 6% increase in uh, accuracy. We train eight times faster, and we can get 95, we need 95% less training data for our readmission models, for our nephritis classifiers, and so on. So that's what I mean by these embeddings have, have a lot of value. So back to the text generation. <clears throat> I mean, you've all seen flashy headlines. I've personally had the holy 
how our Buffalo experiments with, uh, with GPT. Uh, but the flashy headlines overemphasize memorization tasks, the third year med student analogy that, that Russ used. And this is a nice blog by uh, Arvind Narayanan at uh, Princeton and say, you know, we're basically ex subjecting this model to taking a test that is designed for humans. So the analogy I use is think driving. Um, a human goes to the DMV and does a multiple choice test. A car goes to the National Highway Safety uh, Administration and undergoes a rollover test and a crash test. And we put the two together and then have an on-road driving test. We don't make the car take the multiple choice test at the DMV. But that's what we're doing with GPT-4. We're having it take the multiple choice test designed for med students. So what we need is studies that look at how does the AI augmentation make the human better. So we did one uh, with Eric uh, uh, Horvitz and uh, Matt Lundgren's part of this effort as well. And we asked the question that if we have a bedside information need and we pose it to GPT 3.5 and 4, you know, how good is it? Well, the good news, it's not harmful. 12 physicians looked at the responses and unanimously, or majority vote, not unanimous, majority vote, nobody thought that the response was such that it would harm a patient. But then when we asked, does it agreeing with what we know? Eh, low agreement. But the biggest headline was about half the time the 12 people didn't agree with each other as to what does their answer mean. Now, you could say, well, that's just bad protocol design. You, know, you should have nailed down you know, what is agreement, what is disagreement. But I would say in real life, that never exists. You put a response, you get an answer back. And if 12 people looking at the same answer can't agree, we got a problem. The other thing we're doing, and this is Scotty uh, Fleming, who's in the audience, is that why don't we think of uses that use or rely on the generative capability? Because as they say, these, these models are making stuff up. They are generating things that did not exist. They have trouble with factual accuracy. Great. But why don't we use them for use cases where they do have to generate stuff? So what you're looking at on screen are questions that some of are human generated and some are AI generated. Uh, but these are USMLE step two exam questions. And how many of you can tell which one is which? When we did this uh, to three physicians, they couldn't tell 50% accuracy in figuring out what was produced by GPT and what was produced by a human. And their performance on both was the same. And they all passed too. Now imagine being able to produce an unlimited supply of USMLE questions and not have to pay $5,000 to Kaplan. Wouldn't that be nice? All right, so to bring it back together, we have to balance innovation with responsible use. I think we pay way too much attention on building models. Last night I checked, there's 133, uh, terrible handwriting, uh, 133 models that were listed on the CRFM uh, e uh, ecosystem graph. One, three, three. There's GPT, obviously, but there's Hugging Phases launched a hugging chat and an open access model. Why, should, why do we not focus more on verifying the benefits that these models are supposed to provide? And then what about deployment in health systems? I'll show you a slide on each. So to verify the benefits, in the upper left, I have that same triangle. Each row here is one of the purported benefits. And each column is where do I source my model? Do I license an existing one? Do I fine tune or adapt a public one? Or do I build my new one? And all of the check marks are proofs that we have. Uh, you know, Kurt's team has done this one. We're doing this in partnership with Epic. I just showed you an example of this with, uh, with uh, Eric and Matt Lundgren. I showed you the USMLE example, and I've shown you uh, numbers for this. How, as a community, can we fill out this entire grid? What are the use cases on these axes? that we should focus on. I think that's where the high community should, should pay attention. And then deployment in IT systems. Here's a screenshot of a working instance of GPT 3.5 through Azure Open AI APIs. I know it's a mouthful. Uh, in our health system, 0.5 miles from here is the headquarters. 
we can now send and receive PHI through this and do testing in a live environment. If you think in terms of the triad, 133 models, couple of verified benefits, let's just say for argument's sake, 10, and one deployment. I'm just talking this campus. We should change these ratios. I think we need 10 models and 133 use cases and probably 20, 30 deployments. All right, so to finish up, last slide. When using a language model, I think it's really important to ask who built the model, what are the inputs on it which was trained, are the inputs relevant to the intended use? What biases, misinformation do they have? I don't want my doctor trained on Reddit. Don't know about you. Uh, we should ask how and for what tasks was it evaluated? And was the evaluation performed even relevant for the final use that you're envisioning? And if not, what are the evaluations you can do? What are the driving tests that we can do to confirm these claimed value propositions? And then last but not least, these hallucinations, fabrications will happen. These things are generative models. They make stuff up. I and mean, that's why it's called generative AI. How are we going to spot and rectify the factual errors? That's the problem to solve instead of just complaining about them. And it is solvable. There's stuff I'm sure will come up during the panel discussions on how to handle this. Because if I'm running this in the health system, I can't afford factual errors. So we'll stop there and we'll open it up for questions and panel and hand it back to her.